Hello fun people, I'm Isaac Carlson and today I'm sitting down with you to share the story of the decade-long production that allowed audiences to experience once more a journey into imagination told through animation and music. We're going to discuss the fascinating history behind the creation of Roy E. Disney's dazzling and beloved film Fantasia 2000. In 1984, Walt Disney's nephew, Roy E. Disney, would suggest that the Walt Disney Company revive the long-cherished dream of his uncle to continue his legendary animated concert film. Roy wanted to create a new Fantasia, now that he had finally taken some power within his uncle and father's company. That year, after Michael Eisner became chairman and CEO of the Walt Disney Company, along with Frank Wells as president and chief operating officer, Roy Disney was made vice chairman of the board, as well as the chairman of the animation department, which, evolved to become Walt Disney Feature Animation. This regime change had come about because of Roy's frustration and disappointment in the old leadership who had stagnated creatively, were unwilling to evolve with changing audiences and technologies, and had recently been under siege by corporate raiders. In response to the many men who had referred to Roy as the idiot nephew since the days of Walt, Roy had left his original seat on the board, launched a Save Disney campaign, pushed Walt's son-in-law out of the CEO position, and recruited Eisner and Wells to lead the company. With his family's company finally being brought down a new direction, early on in Roy's new role, he wanted to continue one of the greatest creative achievements of his uncle. Walt Disney saw the masterpiece Fantasia as a timeless piece of art that could never be built again, but only be improved and elaborated upon. That's why he had planned to have the film on continual release, with new segments replacing older ones so audiences would never see the same film twice. But after it became a financial failure and received mixed responses from critics, the idea was dropped. By 1942, all of the segments that were considered were shelved and wouldn't be revisited throughout the remainder of Disney's life. In 1980, though, two animators who had worked with Walt Disney, Mel Shaw and Wolfgang Reitherman, the latter being one of Disney's nine old men, started work on a feature film that would combine jazz, classical music, myths, and modern art in a familiar Fantasia format. This film would present ethnic tales with music from the various countries around the world and would be called Musicana. But this was inevitably canceled to create Mickey's Christmas Carol in 1983. When Roy began to advocate for a new Fantasia a year later, unfortunately Disney Animation didn't have the resources to pursue that type of project at the time. And it didn't help, Roy's idea was strongly advocated against by Walt Disney Studios chairman Jeffrey Katzenberg, who had come from Paramount Pictures with Michael Eisner. In the late 1980s and throughout the 1990s though, the Walt Disney Company began releasing creative and commercial successes like The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, and Aladdin, and suddenly the studio's faith in the art form was revitalized. Animation was dominating again, and not just from re-releasing their animated classics and developing new feature films as they went through a renaissance, but also because they had begun bringing their classics to home video. In hopes of preserving the legacy of Walt Disney's classic films, Roy Disney actually, along with Jeffrey Katzenberg, a pairing that wasn't very common, were strongly against bringing films like Pinocchio, Sleeping Beauty, and Cinderella to home video. But all of them had sold millions of units, brought in hundreds of millions in profits, and soon became the largest revenue stream at the company only behind the theme parks. As budgets continued to rise on these animated films, along with the number of animators being employed, eventually Roy Disney suggested around 1990 to Michael Eisner that a new Fantasia would be a great project to keep Keep animators busy, especially after that year's reissue of the original film grossed $25 million domestically. At that same point, Eisner desperately wanted to release the original Fantasia to home video, so he suggested a compromise. Michael Eisner proposed that in exchange for Roy relinquishing his hold on Fantasia so it could come to home video, Roy would be allowed to use the proceeds of the home video release to finance a follow-up to Fantasia. Roy agreed, and after selling 15 million copies of Fantasia, Fantasia, Michael Eisner got the pleasure of calling Walt Disney's widow Lillian to tell her that Fantasia had finally earned a profit. A really touching moment I was so glad existed. Walt's masterpiece was finally going to be carried on into the 21st century, and Roy, the man who had been cast aside all of his life, was finally getting his chance to craft an animated film to be a part of the Disney animation tradition. But unfortunately, it would follow in its predecessor's footsteps as an expensive, polarizing, and tumultuously created production and would exacerbate the growing problems within the new leadership of the Walt Disney Company. 
In 1990, when Michael Eisner allowed development of the Fantasia project to move forward and gave Roy the position of executive producer, there were stipulations put upon Disney. Roy could only use the profits from Fantasia's home release to fund the feature. He had to reuse at least half of the songs from the original, and he had to treat this project as more of a semi-new film. But regardless of the restraints, Roy was excited to leverage the goodwill of the animated classic and move forward in that film's continuity as Walt had initially intended for Fantasia. Soon after the new Fantasia got the go-ahead, Roy assigned Donald Ernst as producer, who had previously produced Aladdin, and Hendel Bedoy as supervising animation director, who Roy had met from creating The Rescuers Down Under. With the green light, a team assembled, and the decision to go over Jeffrey Katzenberg to report directly to Michael Eisner, Roy Disney was ready to create something on his own that held on to the heart of the original work. He was prepared to channel animation, music, and experimentation with technology to build the film that they initially called Fantasia Continued. The team had not fully come together yet though, as Disney knew that it was integral that they bring on a conductor to partner with to begin exploring what a new Fantasia could accomplish. Walt Disney had worked closely with the world-renowned conductor Leopold Stokowski to bring legitimacy to Fantasia, and Roy wanted to emulate that relationship with another musical artist. Conductor Andre Previn rejected being a part of this new Fantasia when Michael Eisner's ideas of including Beatles songs in early discussions came forward, while conductor Len Leonard Bernstein had shown enthusiasm for the concept but died before production even began. Well, Disney never had any interest in including any Beatles songs in Fantasia as he believed them to be inappropriate for a film featuring classical music. Looking back, Eisner was still extremely disappointed in the passing of Bernstein as he believed that he had been the best suited to make Fantasia continue to success. Eisner and Disney just had differing ideas on the direction of the new Fantasia and that would only become more clear as these two egos began to grow larger when Walt Disney feature animation became more successful. Eventually, in September 1991, Roy Disney and future president of Walt Disney feature animation Thomas Schumacher met with the Metropolitan Opera conductor James Levine, who was ecstatic for the opportunity to be a part of a new Fantasia. He was prepared to be collaborative, flexible to abide by the film format, and had empathy for the need to change classical music to allow all of the artists involved to explore music, sound, and animation. Fantasia Fantasia had been a miracle that made Levine feel at home with music as a child, so he was ready to take on the daunting task of contributing to elaborate on the original. While James Levine's life as an abuser would eventually be revealed and would catch up to him years after the production on the film, at the time, Disney, unaware of Levine's horrible actions, was excited to work with the conductor after he instantly said yes to working on the new Fantasia. With their conductor secured, Roy and his artists began to study the content and structure of the original Fantasia as they searched to find new music, imagery, and stories to tell. This would later be described as a painstakingly slow process, as Roy and his creative team sifted through the actual carbine that transcribed the discussions between Walt Disney and Leopold Stokowski and the vast archives of classical music. They were searching for pieces that they not only enjoyed, but allowed them to tell a compelling story. The creatives were beginning to develop the identity they wanted to form for the film, and each of the sections that would be created. The creatives were beginning to develop the identity they wanted to form for the film, and each of the sections that would be created. Roy and his leaders were planning to choose the music along with James Levine, while allowing directors to present to them what they envisioned could be told through that piece. What they had determined was that they wanted to create a film where each song would express a distinct tale, show off a unique art style, and feature an artist at the helm to allow a deeply personal artistic expression to come to life on screen. Screen. The first piece that was suggested to be brought to life that had been personally chosen by Disney and brought great enthusiasm to Levine was Respighi's Pines of Rome, which reminded them of flight. In addition, Roy Disney was fascinated by Shostakovich's Piano Concerto No. 2. To Roy, this was the bouncy, bouncy song, as he would bounce his daughter on his knee when they would listen to it, making him fond to the music. The team also became intrigued by the iconic nature of Beethoven's Symphony No. 5 and its captivating nature with its dun-dun-dun-dun! 
Dun, 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 dun. In 1991, specifically, a concept for Camille Saint Saëns Carnival of the Animals was pitched by the writer and animator Joe Grant, a man who had created the Evil Queen in Snow White, had helped develop Pinocchio, and had co-written Fantasia. Grant suggested that this song be used as a sequel to Dance of the Hours from Fantasia, and should be focused on the ostriches discovering a yo-yo and fighting over it like they had the grapes from the original appearance. But during a story meeting with Michael Eisner, who was closely watching the Fantasia project develop over the years, especially as his relationship with Roy Disney became strained, suggested replacing the ostriches with flamingos. While the team enjoyed the idea of creating a unique identity for the short and adding more life to the visuals through the bold colors of those birds, which led them to eventually decide flamingos were the way to go, Eisner's interventions did become frustrating for Roy and his artists. The most clear manifestation of that was after Eisner attended his son Eric's high school graduation and then insisted that Edward Elgar's Pomp and Circumstance be one of the compositions featured in a segment, since he believed everyone could relate to that piece. The CEO proceeded to outline a story where the music could be used to showcase all of the classic Disney heroes and heroines from Cinderella and Prince Charming to Ariel and Eric, all marching in a wedding procession carrying their future babies. To not much of a surprise, Roy and the animators hated the idea, feeling the mass wedding procession seemed like something from a cult and felt the whole concept was unsettling and corporate. While the artists on Fantasia continued wanted to create universally beloved art for art's sake, eventually a group of animators were put on the segment. Nonetheless, they felt that everything they came up with was an appalling abuse of the characters and was terrible, leading to them refusing to continue to work on the segment. That was especially supported after some of Walt Disney's living Nine Old Men saw the story reel that had been developed around Pomp and Circumstance and reported reacting by saying, that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard. There was another word used in that phrase by Ward Kimball, but I'm sure you guys can fill in the gaps. <laughs> Eisner was eventually told in the news and gave up on the baby's concept, but continued to push the artist to include Pomp and Circumstance in the final film. Roy took this as another price to pay to get the film made. At the same time that they were attempting to identify new pieces to include, they also began to make decisions about which pieces would be brought back from Fantasia. There were discussions to have a shortened version of Night at Bald Mountain return, but that experimentation inevitably failed and was ditched. Disney also considered using Claire de Lune, a piece originally cut from Fantasia that told the story of two great white herons flying through the Everglades, but was deemed pretty boring for what they were hoping to create. For most of the production, the Fantasia Continue team decided to keep on the Nutcracker Suite, Dance the Hours, and the Sorcerer's Apprentice. But of course, all of these pieces would not make it into the final film. By November of 1992, the leadership guiding Fantasia Continued was beginning to discuss a collection of story reels that had been developed. As the years went by, they were selecting music and beginning to build out stories around them, and as early as October of 1993, there was unedited raw footage of Pines of Rome being seen across the studio. While this piece elicited a great deal of emotion in Roy Disney, Hendel Bedoy, the director of this segment, felt as though the piece was lifting listeners off the ground, which eventually led to a variety of artists drawing clouds. One of those clouds reminded everyone of a whale, and suddenly they began to develop a story involving whales flying above the Arctic Circle around the Aurora Borealis, at least from the perspective of penguins on the ground. Initially, the whales would return to the water towards the completion of the song, but it didn't feel right to the creators. Eventually, though, they decided to focus on the journey of one baby whale becoming lost, reuniting with his family, and showing the pod soaring above the clouds. To create the family of flying whales, the artists scanned their drawings into the computer animation production system, better known as CAPS. After finalizing their drawings to make sure the whales moved slowly, felt weighted, and looked believable, the computer-generated characters were animated based on those drawings while their eyes were hand-drawn. To create the pod of whales, the code that was creating the stampede in The Lion King was used since both films were being developed at the same time. This allowed many moving whales to be generated that would not overlap, bump into, or go through one another. Pines of Rome was recorded on March 28, 1994, and was the first piece of music to be recorded by the Chicago Symphony Orchestra for Fantasia Continued. What was created for this segment was a showcase of surrealism and fantasy that utilized technology that was arising in animation. While around this time, Symphony No. 5 was chosen to be a part of the film, even though animated visuals would not be determined for many years, Carnival of Animals, on the other hand, was decided to be led by a single artist. They chose the supervising animator 
writer of The Genie, Eric Goldberg, to write, direct, and animate the entire sequence. While the tale of a flamingo playing with a yo-yo was not necessarily a groundbreaking emotional tale about man's relationship to nature, it was chosen to allow an artist to express himself for fun's sake. To contrast the intense emotional stories that were planned for Fantasia Continued, a piece was chosen to brighten up the film, which I personally think is amazing to have. The flamingos are absolutely whimsical and hilarious. Meanwhile, in an attempt to find a story for pomp and circumstance that would have appeased Michael Eisner's original idea, George Scribner, the director of the project, had numerous Disney characters set to appear in his story reels. But a lot of the humor was expected to come from Donald Duck, who would use the sorcerer's hat to fight off the Disney villains who were planning to crash the party. While the idea of Donald Duck using the sorcerer's hat would eventually be brought by George Scribner to create the Disney Park show Mickey's Philhar Magic, an absolute classic I love to enjoy on vacation in the Magic Kingdom, Donald Duck would remain in this section of Fantasia as well when the artist transitioned away from a Disney wedding to the story of Noah's Ark. With Francis Glebas replacing George Scribner as director, they took the idea of Donald being an assistant to Noah and used an idea by Michael Eisner to have Donald and Daisy constantly missing each other throughout this catastrophe to create a highly entertaining, funny, and resonant Donald Duck short. Since Donald Duck, I think, is the most hilarious classic Disney character, I really appreciate that he got his own segment in a Fantasia film after Mickey Mouse. And after all of that development, Pomp and Circumstance finally had an acceptable role in Fantasia Continued. On April 25th, 1994, just 22 days after the tragic death of Michael Eisner's leadership partner Frank Wells, the second recording session was conducted to add Symphony No. 5, Carnival of the Animals, and Pomp and Circumstance to the catalog of pieces for the new feature. While 1994 marked a massively successful year for Walt Disney feature animation with the release of The Lion King, the loss of Frank Wells was felt deeply across the company. Frank Wells was described not only as being stern and practical, but as a problem solver, who was often the one who kept peace amongst the bold personalities across the company. He kept Katzenberg, Eisner, and Disney in check. Soon after Wells' death, Jeffrey Katzenberg would leave the studio after he vied for Wells' position as president of the Walt Disney Company, leaving Eisner and Disney as the two remaining powerful, driven, and occasionally egotistical leaders at the company. While Michael was seen as a man who was convinced he was the sole person capable of making creative decisions and believed himself to be the new Walt Disney, Roy was seen as a man who blatantly ignored the importance of commercial viability of projects and was without much creative talent. This led to them clashing and these disagreements only were exacerbated as the new Fantasia continued to grow into a larger project. Fantasia was taking a longer amount of time, using more resources, and was adding more segments than originally had been agreed, which frustrated Michael since he knew that the film wasn't going to be a new Lion King or Beauty and the Beast. The film would not lead to new hit characters for the theme parks and the Disney stores like what Pixar accomplished with Toy Story. Fantasia continued, just kept expanding in a dangerous way, but nevertheless, production kept going. After discovering the remnants of a compilation movie by Walt Disney that would have featured the stories of Hans Christian Andersen and specifically noticing the storyboards for The Steadfast Tin Soldier, Roy Disney paired that story with the Piano Concerto No. 2, and it worked perfectly to tell the fairy tale. The bouncy bouncy song with its highs and lows and cathartic experience worked fantastically to tell the tale of the Tin Soldier, and once that was realized, the two works were inseparable. Before Toy Story Story had even been released to stretch the use of computer-generated characters and create realistic-looking figures, the Disney artists worked to successfully blend three-dimensional characters with traditionally painted backgrounds. What was brought to life was realistic-looking characters fighting for love in a fairy tale world that had a rhythm that drove the story forward. It introduced some very dark imagery into the film, brought together inspiration from Disney artists from throughout time, and told a classic and beautiful tale. Much like Pines of Rome, Piano Concerto No. 2 explored the technology of the era and brought forth technological innovations that would later be utilized in future animation projects. With Hendel Bedoy as the director and the recording for this piece taking place on April 24th, 1995, the short told the Tin Soldier's romantic story while contributing to Disney's computer-focused future, and again solidified that no great project ever truly dies at Disney. Throughout the production, Roy felt it was important to find music that would allow them to establish a beginning
beginning and an end that paralleled Fantasia. He hoped to start Fantasia continued with an abstract piece like Fantasia had with Bach's Toccata and Fugue, and would conclude with a piece that was a mixture of the sacred and the profane like Night at Bald Mountain and Ave Maria. Therefore, the team poured through music in search of a satisfying concluding piece, which led them to consider Beethoven's Ninth Symphony and the Alleluia Chorus. Eventually, a 1940 document called Future Fantasias was poured through, which led them to find a piece licensed to Disney in the 1930s. They found Igor Stravinsky's Firebird Suite. Paul and Gaetan Breezy directed the segment using the inspiration that had come to Roy Disney while visiting the area where Mount St. Helens had erupted in 1980. With an idea of exploring the naturalistic rebirth of the land, through this piece they were led to build a story that showcased the forces of birth, death, and renewal. While the segment was primarily produced in Walt Disney Animation France and continued to put the artists leading the project to create the story as they saw fit, they also continued to implement CGI in a thoughtful way. Way. The artists rendered the horns on the elk in CGI, allowing them to create more consistent visuals compared to the time-consuming and inaccurate ones implemented in Bambi. This was the first time a traditionally animated character had traits that were created using computers, which would be a technique later used to craft much more complex elements on characters in films like Treasure Planet. In addition to the elk's horns though, what was brought to life was the tale of a sprite who flew across the world bringing life, facing the destruction of nature, and continuing forward to rebuild the beautiful land again. It's a wonderful segment and is easily one of my favorites within Fantasia's sequel, and on September 28th, 1996, the Firebird was the final piece to be recorded in a session that lasted three hours. But even though this was the last song to be performed by the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, the film was far from being over. Symphony No. 5 was Roy's solution to the abstract beginning for the new Fantasia, as it was a piece that could grab the audience's attention. Pihote Hunt moved forward with this concept for a segment where good multicolored shapes battled against evil dark ones in December 1997 after the leadership rejected pitches from four other animators. While Hunt avoided creating an animated story that was purely abstract and continued to showcase a conflict, he also decided to use computers. They used personality animation to capture how they wanted their objects to move and scanned them into caps to bring the computer generated shapes to life. Over the course of two years, these CGI objects, their movements, and the special effects were then layered on top of pastel backgrounds to create Roy's captivating beginning. Around this stage in production, it was clear that Roy's artists needed more time beyond their theatrical release date of 1997. This led the company to push back the release date two years and led to Fantasia continued to be renamed Fantasia 1999. But inevitably, as the long-running project continued to need more time, the theatrical release was pushed back to the next millennium, which led the name of the feature to be changed one more time to Fantasia 2000. And as the release date continued to creep forward, there were still the live action moments to create, and there was actually still one more piece that would be added to the film. Don Hahn, the producer of The Lion King, was put in place to direct the interstitials for the film, which are the live action moments that act as a way to introduce each number, allow viewers to cleanse their emotional palate and feel as if they are enjoying a concert. Instead of having a single host like the original Fantasia had, Fantasia 2000 decided to have numerous presenters who would exist with the orchestra in a vast, empty, and imaginary plane with show images on large shapes resembling sails. The interstitials were filmed everywhere, from from Los Angeles to New York City and Boston, but the shots with Levine, the artist, and the orchestra were filmed on October 31st, 1998. To create all of these moments, a combination of clips was often designed to flow together. The section with Steve Martin, for example, blended three different recording sessions together to have that scene come to life. Don Hahn and Pihote Hunt developed and designed a surreal place for the music and art to flow out of that continued to feel reminiscent of the original and didn't detract but uplifted the art and music that followed these live action moments. My favorite, of course, is the introduction to Pomp and Circumstance that shows Mickey thanking Stokowski, interacting with Levine, and going to get Donald for the performance. It's classic Disney magic coming to life. The remaining piece that would be added to Fantasia 2000 is one of its most iconic, and actually came from the mind of an animator who had previously contributed to the film. Soon after the release of Aladdin, Eric Goldberg pitched an idea of creating a short using stylized animation based off of 
Al Hirschfeld's art to bring to life George Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue. Hirschfeld was ecstatic to come onto this personal project of Goldberg's to work as a creative consultant, and the special project got greenlit on its own outside of Fantasia 2000 during the 1998 hiatus that existed on another Disney feature being produced titled Kingdom in the Sun. Under Goldberg's leadership, the animators used the jazz music that was created for the concert hall, which was performed by the Philharmonia Orchestra, to showcase the story of four groups in New York City pursuing their dreams during the Great Depression. While the animators efficiently created the short two months early, it's said that the Broadway ending sequence contained so many colors, over 200 in fact, that the cap system had trouble rendering it, causing delays in the production of Tarzan. I love hearing stories like this that connect all the features and show everything doesn't happen in isolation. Walt Disney Animation is a big organization that works together. When Roy Disney saw an early version of Goldberg's project, he knew instantly he wanted to have it in Fantasia. 2000. He was excited by the idea of having an American composer, a non-traditional style of animation, and a standout type of music be a part of the show. Rhapsody in Blue was a special segment that I think is just beautiful and captivating and does a great job of pushing forward what Fantasia meant to the world. That's why Roy decided to remove the Dance of the Hours and replace it with Rhapsody in Blue a year before release. The Nutcracker Suite was also dropped from the lineup within the last few months leading up to the release date after a preview screening showed it created an unintentional lull in the context of the new pieces, especially when it was already familiar to audiences. That meant The Sorcerer's Apprentice was the only returning segment from the original Fantasia. The semi-new film idea from Fantasia Continued's conception was no more. This was a new entry in the Disney canon and Roy was desperate to try to make that clear. While Walt Disney had released Fantasia with a stereophonic technology called Fantasound, Roy Disney supported the idea of Disney executive Dick Cook to have Fantasia 2000 be the first animated feature film released in IMAX with a six channel digital sound system to create a sense of event for the film. A combination of computer graphics, digital recording, and being presented in IMAX was done in hopes of not only experimenting with technology, but to create a crisp, beautiful, and emotional response when Fantasia was brought to audiences. And when Fantasia 2000 came, it did so in a very large and very expensive way. The film premiered at Carnegie Hall in New York City on December 17th, 1999 for three nights as a part of a five-city concert tour that featured the Philharmonia Orchestra performing the music under the direction of Levine live with the animation. After New York, performances followed in London on December 21st, Paris on December 22nd, in Tokyo on December 27th, and in Pasadena, California on December December 31st as a part of a New Year's Eve gala. Each of these performances cost well over a million dollars to put on, but Roy was ecstatic to put on the show. At midnight on December 31st, 1999, Fantasia 2000 was the first film released in theaters in the new millennium and began a four month run exclusively at 75 IMAX cinemas. Each theater was decorated with a museum-like exhibit with educational material and large displays adjacent to the theater. Roy fought to keep the experience of Fantasia 2000 pure, which even led the Walt Disney Company to construct a temporary 622-seat theater costing almost $4 million for its Los Angeles run after Disney was unable to reach an agreement to only have the film shown during the four months at the city's sole IMAX theater at the California Science Center. While creative executives like Thomas Schumacher were concerned Concerned there would be little curiosity and interest when the film had its wide release. At the time, it did set new records as the highest grossing IMAX engagement, but unfortunately, even in its initial run, Fantasia 2000 was swept under the excitement of the Millennium Celebrations. Audiences felt mixed emotions about the film. Some felt it was an entertaining experience for adults and children alike and was splendid entertainment, while others felt the whole performance was a giant corporate promotion that was too simple, breezy, and lightweight. People felt it wasn't especially innovative at the time of its release, now that Pixar had firmly established their ability to create fully computer animated films and believed it didn't push its subject matter into interesting places. There were some who saw Fantasia's sequel as jarring, as the transition from hilarious and beautiful moments to others that were deemed unoriginal. Following its release in 1,313 theaters in the United States on June 16, 2000, the film opened to gross $2.8 million in its opening weekend, leaving it ranking 11th at the box office. 
After the IMAX and wide release, the film grossed over $90.8 million, but with a budget of $80 million, it was far from a commercial success, leaving Eisner with the belief that the film was Roy Disney's folly. The CEO lost a lot of respect for Roy, had become convinced that the man had little talent, and was frustrated with him since he had disregarded a lot of his guidance and advice, and had focused on the art over the other concerns that were facing the studio. Sensing this, Roy clearly felt that once again he had been looked over and labeled as the idiot nephew, which grew the rift between these men. While development on a third film began in 2002 under the working title Fantasia 2006, the project was canceled in 2004. A segment titled One by One was created by Roger Allers, best known for directing The Lion King during this period, along with Pejote Hunt, who returned to create The Little Mash Girl. Both of these shorts were eventually released as standalone short films, and with that decision, a third Fantasia was left waiting in the wings. Roy Disney received the opportunity to follow up on his uncle's masterpiece with Fantasia 2000, and unfortunately it was led to a similar fate to the original. Both films went through extensive productions, initially received mixed reviews, and in the short term were not commercial successes, but especially at the time of Fantasia 2000's conception, it was a forward-thinking endeavor. To reclaim the creative prestige that had been lost after Walt Disney's death, that man's nephew wanted the chance to prove that the Disney artists of his day were capable of utilizing unfamiliar visuals, exploring new technologies, and were interested in creating art. To look towards the future, Roy wanted to dive into a project from the past to allow his animators to reconnect with Walt Disney's legacy. But by the time the film was released, least competition in the animation industry had become fierce. Production costs were soaring across all animated films, and the accomplishments of Walt Disney feature animation was dwarfed by other studios. With companies arising like Jeffrey Katzenberg's DreamWorks and Steve Jobs' Pixar, competition was only growing in animation as studios became focused on taking Disney's market share in this revived industry. Other studios were aggressively captivating audiences with compelling stories and new technologies, so it disappointment like this hurt in the changing landscape. The film wasn't a complete failure by any measure, but it paled in comparison to the praise and box office success of films that had come before it. While Roy Disney had expanded Walt Disney's dream of having Fantasia be a showcase of the unusual, forward-thinking, and wondrous ideas in animation, a dark era was beginning. Tensions were high amongst the leadership of the Walt Disney Company at the time of Fantasia 2000's release, and that would only become exacerbated as Walt Walt Disney feature animation desperately attempted to continue their reign as the leaders in the animation industry. To do that, the leadership would follow in this production's footsteps by attempting to look to the past for inspiration, leverage new computer innovations, and provide a modern take on storytelling. Fantasia 2000 didn't cause this experimental era to begin, but it is the film that embodies what would be produced by Walt Disney feature animation over the following 10 years. There would be successes, there would be failures, there would be corporate intervention into the art, pressure to make projects succeed, daring innovations in the realm of animation, and throughout it all, Roy Disney would continue to ensure his family's company would be focused on thriving in the 21st century, engaging with creative ideas, and would always have animation at the center of of it all. I have loved having the opportunity over the last four years to discuss Disney animation theories, characters, and stories, but I'm also feeling super excited to apply what I've learned to take on a bigger project like this. This type of long-form documentary is a video format I've really come to enjoy on YouTube, and I just came to realize that this is the kind of video that I want to see made right now. That's why when I began to discover this time period and I began to research it, all of a sudden I got this big surge of excitement and I knew this is what I wanted to make. I want to fully explore this dark era in Disney history by discussing how the films during this period were made. And if you want to help support me when I do that and ensure that I'm able to continue developing different series like this one, please consider subscribing, sharing the episode, and supporting me over on Patreon, which is linked below. Over there, you can get access to the Discord, behind the scenes videos, and become featured at the end of videos as a producer. Beyond watching my videos or listening to those episodes on my podcast, Watso Radio, it's probably the best way to support me and allows you to be part of creating the magic. Thank you for all of your support today, in the past, and into the future. Thanks for watching, and have a magical day.